now that we've discussed several methods for eliciting von Neumann Morgenstern utility functions, let's have a look at how to elicit uh, probability measures, subjective probabilities. So the first technique we'll look at is called matching. Before we do, let's just recap the basic framework of choice under uncertainty. So if we consider an act or an action, we've seen this in several lectures before, where an action, uh, lowercase a, is a state contingent um, outcome. So if event A1 happens, remember that means the true state of the world belongs to event A1, then under action A, the decision maker will receive outcome X1, and so on up to event K, if the true state of the world belongs to event K, then under action A, our decision maker will receive outcome XK. The subjective expected utility of the act A is as follows. So the decision maker has two components, uh, a probability measure, capital P, which quantifies their belief regarding the likelihood of these events, and a utility function, a von Neumann Morgenstern utility function for the outcomes. So the uh, outcome X1, for example, we take the utility of that outcome, and then we multiply it by the subjective probability, capital P of A1. We do this for all K outcomes, taking this weighted sum, which gives the subjective expected utility of the act. So when it comes to choice under uncertainty, subjective expected utility, there are two main ingredients, the von Neumann Morgenstern utility function little u, which we've seen how to elicit using various techniques, and then this subjective probability measure, capital P. So suppose we want to elicit this probability measure, P. Using the probability matching technique, we'll be able to find the probability of any particular event. So suppose we want to find the probability of event A or the value that the probability measure capital P assigns to the event A, well, this object is called a bet on event A. So what is a bet? It is um, essentially we have two outcomes, overline X and underline X. And remember, we denoted overline X as the best outcome. So under this particular action that we're looking at in green, this says if the event A happens, you get the best outcome over line X. And if the event not A happens, then you get the worst outcome under line X. So this is called a bet on A. Now, for the matching procedure, what we're essentially going to do is match in terms of preferences. So find an indifference. We're looking for a gamble, an objective lottery with probability P assigned to the best outcome, such that the decision maker is indifferent between the uncertain bet on the event A and the lottery which assigns probability P to the best outcome. So notice that if we substitute expected utility, the probability uh, capital A will be precisely equal to P. So whenever we want to find the value that this probability measure, capital P, assigns to any particular event, then we construct a bet based on that event and then match it through an indifference to an objectively risky uh, gamble and then take the probability attached to the best outcome in that gamble as the value of the um, probability measure. OK, so now let's have a look at something called a proper scoring rule. So what is a proper scoring rule? Essentially, so I'm going to represent it as this uncertain type of action. So let's imagine that we're interested in the, an event A. And I'm going to give you some outcome if the event A happens. OK, so there's a formula for this. 1 minus 1 minus R all squared. And if the event 
uh, not A happens, well, then your payment is 1 minus R squared. Okay? Well, what is R <laughs> is the question so far. It is a, it's an amount that you have to tell me. So you have to report R. Okay, that's your job. I present you with a, a proper scoring rule, and then I want you to tell me a number R. And of course, what do decision makers do? They want to choose their most preferred R, and it's going to determine the payments. So let's have a look at this a second. If I imagine that R equals zero, okay, then what am I doing? Well, then this payment would be one minus, then one minus zero here, so one minus one. This payment would be zero. And this payment would be 1 minus 0, would be 1. So I'd get 0 if the event happens. I'd get 1 if it doesn't happen. OK? If I said r equals 1, then it's the other way around. I get 0 if the event doesn't happen, but I get 1 if it does happen. OK? And then in between, you can, you can see that essentially by increasing my r, I'm shifting if I start from zero, I'm putting all my money on not A event, and then I can start to send more money over here. I reduce my payment in this event, and it increases my payment in this event. And the trade-off is determined by these precise formulas, 1 minus 1 minus R squared, and 1 minus R squared on this side. Okay, so what's the best choice of R? Okay. How should I solve this problem? Well, we're going to assume that uh, our decision maker is risk neutral. OK, now we'll have a lot to say about why that's quite a reasonable assumption towards the end of the lecture. And we'll also show you a way of avoiding that assumption uh, in what follows next using something called a binary lottery procedure. But let's imagine that you're risk neutral. How do you evaluate this particular uh, object. Now, this is called a scoring rule. Actually, it's called a proper scoring rule. Um, so how would you evaluate the proper scoring rule? Well, you say with some probability PA, I'm risk neutral, so my utility is linear. I get the payment 1 minus 1 minus R squared. And with probability 1 minus P of A, Okay, so these are subjective probabilities. These are the things we want to measure. Um, I get the payment 1 minus R squared. Okay, so what do I want to do? This is my subjective expected utility. I want to maximize this expression by choosing R. Okay, now if you notice, we've got a, a minus squared and minus squared here. So this is a, a, a concave function of R. OK, so um, the necessary and sufficient conditions for solving this problem will be the first order conditions, um, which I get by differentiating this with respect to R and then finding the particular R star value uh, that makes the derivative zero. So let's differentiate this with respect to R. So if I diff uh, the, the first order condition would be um, I would get two times p of a multiplied by um, 1 minus r star and minus 2 of 1 minus p of a times by r star. OK, and that would equal 0. That's the r star makes this derivative equal to 0. OK, so if I rearrange this quite quickly, I can see that these twos are going to cancel out. I get 1 minus R star over R star. Get the R's by themselves. And on the other side, I get 1 minus my subjective probability for the event A divided by the same. Um, and this is equivalent to R star equals my subjective probability for the event A. Now, isn't that magic? So what we have here is an incentive compatible method for eliciting subjective probabilities. OK, um, so in particular, uh, when the decision maker is risk neutral in this case, 
Um, they will solve, they will look at this proper scoring rule. They're asked to report a number and they want to choose their most preferred number. And simply by solving that problem, their optimal answer is simply to tell me what the probab what they think the probability of A actually is. So it's an incentive compatible method for eliciting, eliciting subjective probabilities. Now, one thing to notice about proper scoring rules is that presenting uh, experimental subjects, so presenting human beings with uh, complicated calculus problems to solve, is, uh, is probably not going to work. So how is this proper scoring rule idea actually used in experiments? Well, have a look at the following table. This is saying, choose your favorite pair, pair zero, one, two, three, all the way up to 100. I've just included a few, but you could have as many of these pairs as you like. And then it says a payment if it's sunny, zero pound for pair zero, and a payment if it's rainy is 100 pound for pair zero. And then looking at pair 100, that puts all of the £100 on the sunny event and £0 on the rainy event. So this is essentially the proper scoring rule. Where is R? Well, by choosing pair 0, you are indirectly announcing R equals 0. By choosing pair 25, you're indirectly announcing a number R equals 0.25. So you can take whichever pair that is chosen and divide it by 100. And that is the decision maker's subjective probability for the event. It is sunny. Um, so how did we calculate these values? Well, the yellow values, the payment if it is sunny, is just a, the scoring rule. And I just multiplied the numbers by 100. So we get 100 minus 100 times 1 minus r squared if it's sunny. And if it's rainy, 100 minus 100 r squared. So this is a way of presenting that proper scoring rule idea. And where, as, uh, as individuals look through the list of pairs of possible payments, and you can make the list as fine grained as you like, one, when they find their favorite pair of payments, they indirectly reveal what their subjective probability for the sunny event actually is. So finally, let's discuss something called the binary lottery procedure. This is a very simple idea, but it's incredibly useful for eliciting subjective probabilities. And it also plays an important role in testing game theory in experiments. So what is the binary lottery procedure? Um, essentially, it means paying in probability points. So let's have a look at the quadratic scoring rule that we've just studied. Here it is. If event A happens, you get paid 1 minus 1 minus R squared. And if A does not happen, if not A happens, then you get a payment 1 minus R squared. And implicitly, we were assuming that these numbers were measured in pounds, so amounts of money in whatever currency. And so when we assumed that the utility of x pounds is equal to x, we were making the assumption that our decision maker is risk neutral. But really, we don't need risk neutrality so much. We just need utility to be linear in whatever currency we're paying our experimental subjects in. So consider the following. Instead of paying in pounds, I could say that this number 1 minus 1 minus r squared is the probability p in a lottery where you get some good outcome over line x with probability p. Otherwise, you receive the bad outcome underlined x. That is, the payments we're making to our subject based on his decision choosing a number r are probability numbers. So we are paying our subject in probability. They, can, they are going to get a lottery that depends on the state of the world. And in one state, the probability attached to the best outcome is 1 minus 1 minus r squared. And if the event A does not happen, then the probability attached to the best outcome is 1 minus r squared. Now, 
expected utility under the usual normalization where we set the utility of the best outcome equal to one and the utility of the worst outcome equal to zero, the expected utility of this lottery is simply equal to P. And so we have found a currency for which our decision maker has linear utility by paying subjects in probability currency their utility must be linear if they are expected utility maximizers. In this way, we can induce linear utility by paying in probability points. In theory, this means proper scoring rules will work if we pay in probability points and it doesn't matter whether our subjects are risk neutral or risk averse any utility function will work because expected utility is always a linear function of the probabilities involved. This approach of paying in probability points is widely known as the binary lottery procedure. It's very important as well in testing the theory of games. So very frequently you'll see games represented in a kind of matrix form with numbers in all of the cells describing the payoffs for each player. And importantly, in game theory, those numbers are always utility numbers. So if you were to do an experiment and pay people in pounds and assume that you were testing Nash equilibrium as a solution concept, then you would need to know what the utility for those pounds were. If you pay in probability points, then you already know precisely what the uh, utility numbers are, and so you can perform proper tests of game theory. I think the Nobel Prize winner Alvin Roth used this technique first when testing bargaining theory in experiments. But the idea is older than that, and indeed anyone who understands expected utility theory knows that the functional form is linear in probabilities.